Okay. Shall we start? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we will slowly start. We assume others to join. So, first, if you open in words, I greet you all and thank you for coming. Honorable colleagues, participants of the initial CIOS Culture Economics Online Seminar, it is a pleasure to greet you after several months of preparations of this interesting and surely much needed initiative. As a result of the unfortunate pandemic, time scientific activities have to a large extent gone online and formation of online seminars has become one of more interesting scientific novelties of last year, as I think all of us have observed. Its predominant benefit is surely in connecting the researchers across the globe without transaction costs and many of the existing online seminars. I mentioned just a few, Gary Chamberlain's seminar in econometrics, many other economic online seminars such as virtual micro seminar series, interactive online industrial organization seminar, virtual finance theory seminar and virtual economic history seminar, many one world mathematical seminars and some seminars in the area of culture and the arts, some of them still in formation, such as seminars of the Compendium of Culture Policies and Trends, have demonstrated significant benefits of being connected, having possibilities of constant and no cost interactions with colleagues and peers and being able to present and discuss your our work to the global scientific community. It were these considerations which led to the formation of the Culture Economic Online Seminar series. I express great gratitude to, to colleagues from Economist Stock Art blog, in particular, Teresa Navarrete Hernandez, which will also lead the today's webinar uh, with myself, moderated for accepting the initial spark and idea. Association for Culture Economics International, ACI, and in particular its president, Trine Pile. I think she's with us, although she reported she might not join, and Executive Secretary Treasurer Bronwyn Code for large support to this idea and extensive help and support in its realization. And the 13 member organizational team, Anna Flavia. Chado, Anna Mignosa, Andrea Baldin, Douglas Noonan, Erwin Decker, Janet Snowball, Karol Jamporowiecki, Kazuko Goto, Ruth Rentschler, and Trine Pile for the willingness to join the adventure and for several preliminary discussions which helped the seminar to get the shape as presented today. The seminar will take place on bi-weekly level every two weeks and is aimed to provide a forum for researchers worldwide to present their work in culture economics and related areas. It will represent emerging through to well-established scholars showcasing a wide variety of research within culture economics broadly defined in terms of both topic and method. It is therefore open to any of you. Please write us emails with proposals and we will try to consider how to include them in the program in the best possible manner. We are planning of establishing connections to some, I would say, neighboring organizations such as IMAC, ICCPR, and CATC and TIAMSA. For TIAMSA, for the later, we already have full support of its chair, Dr. Johannes Nathan, to provide the seminar a wider outreach. With this, I would end, uh, not to take too much place, the seminar will feature its website, which is still in final amendments, and you will be able to find most of the relevant information. There, I would just like to mention that in future, not already for this initial seminar, we are also planning to organize post seminars after each seminar, this is the practice of some other seminars, which have largely proven uh, a good practice, which would allow slightly less formal discussions and in particular possibilities for younger scholars. Also one of the aim of the seminar 
itself to be able to meet and discuss with the speakers and the more established and experienced culture economists as well as policy and management scholars. I hope and I'm sure of a great event today and I leave now the work to my colleague Trilce to also introduce the today's event and three excellent speakers among them. We are particularly happy, I would say, to host Professor David Trosby, I would say a legend in the field and honorary fellow of ACEI that will present and discuss their views on the current pandemic situation in the arts in different geographic regions. Thank you again for attending and please do follow this CEOS, rather strange name, but a shortening uh, for Culture Economics Online Seminar, seminars and our work also in the future. This promises to be a lasting initiative with a lot of impact on culture, economic, and neighboring research communities. I would leave the word now to Teresa. Thank you. Thank you, André. Well, just um, with that, I'll start with the first thing. Um, we'll start recording the presentation now. So if anybody does not want to be recorded, please um, mute your camera. Here we go. Uh, record this meeting. Um, and then I would like to then just as, um, continue briefly what Andre said, and we'll have today three speakers. So we'll start with uh, Professor David Rosby from Macquarie University, known to everybody, I suppose, and then follow with Jen Snowball from Rhodes University in South Africa, and, and then Enzico Bertaccini from the University of Torino. What we are hoping is after these short presentations, um, you can please uh, make some pressing questions during the chat. And um, otherwise, please save your questions at the end so that we have enough time when we will have enough time for discussion. Um, just I think we'll all uh, been in enough Zoom meetings, but I'll just remind everybody it's uh, helpful if you mute yourself. And um, so please let's uh, use the chat um, between Andre Bronwyn and I will be uh, moderating this chat. Um, at the end, if we, when we go into the discussion, um, you're welcome to po pose your question in the discussion. And then depending on the dynamics, we might allow some people to present their questions themselves. Otherwise, we'll just uh, summarize the questions. Um, and, and with that, um, I guess I wish you a great um, seminar. And please, I give the word to David. Okay, well, look, thank you very much, uh, and thank you, uh, Andre, for your remarks. Um, and I'd just like to begin by congratulating you both, uh, Andre and Trilsa, uh, taking the lead, but also not just you two, but also the others. You mentioned, uh, Andre, all the names, many of uh, the uh, members of the association who have been involved in getting this uh, enterprise uh, underway. And it is a really uh, remarkable thing to be happening, and, and one which is a really great initiative, I have to say. Um, we, we, it, it gives an opportunity, I think, particularly for younger scholars, but not, but not necessarily only younger scholars. Uh, but it's, uh, we, we do have the biennial conference, of course, as a means for people to present their ideas in a working paper. But now this is something which is also available much more readily than having to go to a conference. And so it is really very welcome to, have to see this. And we hope that uh, a lot of people will take the opportunity to put their, their work uh, up for discussion and feedback and it can be really very useful to, to people. I'll just speak very briefly um, about the impact of the pandemic here in Australia um, before handing on to Jen and Enrico who have more detailed presentations to make. Um, but just by way of background, um, the context here in Australia is that we've in a way been rather fortunate because the seriousness of the pandemic was realized quite early, um, as early as sort of January and February of last year. And the uh, rather unusually for a country where government doesn't uh, necessarily take a very great role in, the, in managing things, uh, we did actually have um, for a period, it doesn't, doesn't exist any longer, but we did have for a few months of, uh, what you could call a government of national unity, where the, where the state uh, governments and the federal government came together uh, from different sides of the political spectrum and managed to agree on a program for uh, essentially a whole national lockdown uh, through from March right through till the middle of the year. 
And that was uh, absolutely instrumental in, in ensuring that the pandemic didn't uh, take off and become uncontrolled as it has in, in so many other countries. And so um, uh, as a result, um, we've had uh, we've had second waves and third waves, but these have been really quite minor and very local. Uh, and and the governments and the authorities have have uh, poached on pounced on these quite quickly. Um, uh, we look we look with some surprise sometimes at the fact that it's announced that say there have been 800 new uh, COVID infections in the UK overnight, and we have uh, two or three. Uh, new COVID infections, and that's a that's a sort of major disaster here. Well, but, well not quite a major disaster, but it, it can lead to uh, to, a, to a lockdown. In fact, there's one on at the moment for Bronwyn in Victoria, um, the state of Victoria. That's uh, locked down at the moment because of an outbreak uh, uh, at the weekend, um, and uh, that's going to finish tomorrow. But it's that's the sort of thing that's been happening here. People, by and large, have been accepting this, not entirely, of course, but uh, by and large. So that's been the that's been the pattern in which the arts and the cultural sector has uh, existed and tried to um, function. Well, of course, uh, the whole economy was hit very hard, like everybody's economies have been, and the arts, particularly, and the cultural sector, particularly, um, was extremely hard hit uh, early in the piece and continued. And the and the worst uh, effects, of course, were felt on individual artists. Um, who were not eligible for the major program that the government instituted to support wages uh, for workers who, whose employment had been compromised by the pandemic, either because the business had closed down or the business had gone into temporary um, recession or whatever. Uh, there was a, quite an extensive program called JobKeeper, which was essentially paying a wage subsidy for workers who were uh, out of work. And it continues, it still continues now. It's going to finish at the end of next month. Um, but that's, that has been absolutely instrumental in maintaining uh, employment. And so in, uh, in, although unemployment has gone up, it hasn't gone up as much as in other countries. And in fact, uh, the fact that we have dealt with the health problem first, rather than trying to, to deal with the economic problems has meant that dealing with the health problems has in fact had a very positive effect on the economy. And so the economy is, is starting to recover now quite strongly um, because I think it's generally agreed because of the fact that the health issues were well, well looked after. Um, but from the point of view of the arts, it hasn't been easy. Uh, artists, as we know, are predominantly um, freelancers here in Australia. Our own surveys have shown um, roughly 85% in their principal artistic occupation of artists are either freelance or casual. And they didn't qualify for the JobKeeper program, despite the fact that there were very loud protests from the industry that it wouldn't be difficult to extend the coverage to include such people that was um, met with no response. And so artists have really done it really very tough. The, um, the, the companies, uh, on the whole, the same sort of thing has applied to companies in the sense that, I mean, performing companies, uh, museums, galleries, and so on, because demand just uh, just completely stopped, completely dried up. Um, and so uh, the, the larger publicly supported performing companies like the state theatre companies and the orchestras and the, the opera and the dance company, the, the dance company and uh, the museums and the public museums and galleries they were all reasonably um, strong in their sort of financial under um, uh, foundations. And so they had to sort of um, scale back their operations uh, very much, but they were able to survive. The, in, in the performing arts sector, the ones who suffered most, of course, as always is the case with the small to medium enterprises, the little ones who, who really couldn't make it without any audiences and with nothing much happening. Uh, and some of those have gone out of business or just gone into recession, and some of them may be coming back again now, but it's, uh, it's been pretty, pretty hard on them. So uh, that's been the problem. Um, and uh, rather belatedly, the government did move, uh, did take some action and did provide some targeted assistance for uh, the cultural sector and for the arts. Um, after a lot of pressure, um, we, we have a government at the moment who, that hasn't really been particularly interested in the arts, I have to say. And, um, and so unlike some of our previous governments, 
And so it's been quite difficult for them, even pressing very strongly the, uh, the, the economic case uh, as to the, the strong economic contribution and to employment and to output from the cultural sector and the cultural industries, uh, this hasn't really been taken very much on board. So um, that's, the, that's the situation. Um, now we have uh, here in uh, February of 2021, uh, we are, we, we, there is a general sense around the country that we're through the worst of it and that we're getting, um, we're starting to recover quite strongly. And in the performing arts or in the arts generally, there is a very strong sense that things are coming back to normal. During the pandemic, um, uh, some of the companies did move into more online presentations as they have done all around the world um, to uh, try to maintain some sort of audience for their work. Um, I don't think that's been, I mean, I think the, the, it's still too early to say to what extent that uh, has really proved uh, a lifeline for very many organizations uh, because of the question that there hasn't, uh, there isn't necessarily an immediate uptake by audiences of uh, an alternative form of consumption that is having to pay for stuff that they see online when they'd rather be uh, in the in the uh, in the theatre or in the music uh, environment to hear live music and so on. So it's it's still unclear as to just how uh, much the online presence is is has has really made a difference. It has made some difference, but it's not clear just how much. But nevertheless, with this um, with the, the the movement now towards uh, the, um, the the worst of the pandemic being over, and the and the worst of the restrictions being lifted, we now have uh, more uh, travel possible. We we had complete shutdown of travel uh, within the country up until, um, and there's still some restrictions, but uh, it's been quite difficult to get around the country, let alone overseas. Well, we haven't been able to go overseas because the country is still closed to overseas. And that's a big problem for me because I do make a lot of overseas trips every year and I've been stuck in Australia since uh, January of last year. Um, and that doesn't look like changing anytime soon because the, uh, the present indications are that it's most unlikely that we'll have overseas travel from Australia uh, anytime in, in this current year, current um, calendar year. So it's, uh, that's not good, but, but within, the, <laughs> within the country, things have been, uh, have, have been opening up. And the theatres and the audiences have been uh, starting to reassemble. There have been some audience monitor surveys to try to find out whether uh, people um, feel safe about coming back into theatres, into uh, other uh, venues. Um, and there are still a few people who are not, don't feel safe, despite the fact that there are very stringent um, COVID safe um, uh, uh, regulations and stipulations uh, right throughout uh, the art sector so that for example in the, in the theater in the opera now it's still um, mandatory to wear masks people will wear, we, we do wear masks except that uh, there was a case uh, yesterday or the day before in the opera here in Sydney um, uh, everybody was wearing their mask in the audience except for two people who, who, who refused to wear their masks and so they got the police to come and, and escort them out of the opera uh, because, and that's how seriously these things are taken. Um, uh, and of course, everybody uh, who was there wearing the mask applauded uh, the, at the fact that these uh, renegades had been ejected. But um, uh, it's, it's we, we have got used to that. And I mean, it's still only 50 or 75% of capacity because there has to be a, the, the space between the seats and um, you know, you can't sit next to anybody. And so it goes and so it goes. So all of that's been happening. Um, look, now, as I said, things are starting to get back more to normal. Um, there have been um, some further government uh, injections into the industry, and there's one particularly which might be of interest. Um, it's a fund which was set up actually last year for $75 million, um, which uh, wasn't really a great deal of money. But it picks up on uh, investment in, in new sort of innovative ideas for developing new projects for arts, uh, for individual artists and for arts organizations. It's called the Restart, in, um, Restart Investment to Sustain and Expand, which is very awkward to, 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 to have the acronym RISE, R-I-S-E, uh, which is a sort of rather corny 
uh, way of doing it. But um, but anyway, it's, it's it's quite an interesting fund to have a look at because it is a way in which the public sector can uh, contribute to the innovation processes which uh, are um, necessary and and the transition. Particularly, this is particularly towards the digital environment. Uh, look, that's just about all I want to say. Um, um, but just in conclusion. Um, just the same thing about research and how the COVID-19 has affected our own research um, as researchers, because everybody here at this uh, webinar will be researchers um, themselves and will be thinking about their own research programs. And um, of course, there's a lot of research going on um, on um, the impact of the pandemic on artists and arts organizations and so on. Some of that uh, Jen will be talking about in South Africa because they've been doing quite a lot of, a lot of that sort of thing there. And, um, uh, and just about everywhere, I think there's been, there has been quite a lot of just simply data gathering, but also some more um, sort of analytical research on what's been happening. And so that's all quite, that's uh, all very important because we do need to know um, just how these sorts of major shocks to the to the cultural industries is actually affecting what's what goes on uh, and and what that means about the sort of recovery process and how that's going to look but but there's also I think some interesting longer term issues about um, demand about preferences about attitudes as to whether or not there are some, some certain fundamentals about people's attitudes and preferences in relation to things like our consumption of the arts, which in a sense are, are there. If you're a theatre goer or an opera goer, is that going to be changed by the fact that you can't go to the theatre for, for 12 months or you can't go to the opera for 12 months? And when, the, when it all comes back again, will you still be a theatre goer? Are your, are your preferences for theatre are still going to be pretty much the same as they were before? And that's a, that, that I think is quite an interesting research question to think about. Um, we've been doing some work here with my colleagues on, um, on uh, value creation by the live theatre and we have, um, so we're doing surveys and the surveys, we've really tried to put people into thinking about what was it like before, uh, think about the last, the year before the thing, you know, what were your sort of feelings about going to the theatre then uh, and the, the proposition might be that when this is all over, those sorts of attitudes will still be will still be relevant. Um, who knows? We don't know. Um, but that's that that is an issue, I think, for the design of questionnaires and surveys now. Um, to what extent they need to take advantage, take account of the fact that, of course, this is happening in the most unusual uh, circumstance. But nevertheless, it may still be possible to find things which will be of longer term relevance once the pandemic's over. So that's all I'd like to say for now, and uh, I'll leave it to my colleagues to take it further. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we have one uh, first comment by Ario Klammer. We do not know what the impact of art practices are, so how can we determine what the consequences are of Corona? The impact is not just economic, but also social and cultural. Do we as cultural economists have a clue? Maybe a short response before we take the next. Oh, I'm sure we uh, you, you see the, com the comments? Well, I mean, I suppose, well, if I can comment, I, th I mean, I think that's right, I suppose, in the sense that we, we, we still don't know what the impact is going to be. We, we, can, we can get a fairly good idea of where people are at the moment. And I think, you know, a lot of the work which is going on at the moment does. People can imagine uh, what the world was like before the pandemic. They, can, they know what the world is like during the pandemic, and they can sort of imagine what it's going to be like after the, after the pandemic. And so uh, we, we can, I think, we can do some quite useful work in trying to map that all out. That's all I could say. I don't think that it's, it, it, we should be saying we just don't know it, and so we can't do anything about it. I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure that that's what Ario is saying, but that's. Um, I, I think we really do have to look at this as researchers and think. You know, how do we position ourselves? How do we look at what's going on, um, both in a historical sense and in a and a forward-looking sense, as well as in the present sense. Okay. Yeah, thank I you, think, David. I think it would be time to go to the next. Um, 
presentation while also Tim Fry, I think, has a response. Uh, um, I would ask Jen Snowball now basically to also start her presentation. Jen, maybe if you share the slides. Sure, thanks, thanks very much. We will try just... to post all the questions at the end as well. Thanks. Thanks, okay, so I'm sharing my screen. So I hope that means you can see it now, right? Yes, yep. we can see it. Great, okay. Yeah. Good, well, well, thank you very much to um, Andre and Trilka for inviting, inviting me to be part of the opening seminar. Um, listening to David talk, Wow, I wish South Africa was in that situation. Um, we've been in lockdown um, since the end of March last year, and we're still in lockdown. Um, we have different levels. So uh, we started at level five, which was when there were sort of very serious um, limitations, even on going to work. Um, now we're in level three. So there's some um, adjustments, allowable travel and so on, but um, very, still very strict rules. Uh, we can be arrested if we don't wear a mask in public, um, any public place. And um, there are even rules about how people have to be in um, public transport or even in uh, private cars. Uh, indoor um, gatherings are a maximum of 50 people and outdoor gatherings 100 people with social distancing. So it's a bit of a different picture. Uh, we're going into winter now so we're expecting another wave because we have not yet started vaccination. So a um, bit gloomy. Um, but what I wanted to sort of talk about today was some research that the Cultural Observatory um, did. Uh, early on in the pandemic, um, and then a little bit about some of the cheerful stuff, so some of the um, adaptations that happened. Um, the cultural sector in South Africa is not very big. It, it makes up about 1.7, call it 2% of, of South Africa's GDP, if we're using the sort of UNESCO um, definition. So you can see a big part of that is the commercial design and creative industries, and then smaller sections um, or smaller parts from the other sectors. Um, so what we did was in, in April of last year, we ran a survey uh, about uh, asking uh, the people in the creative sector um, about the impact of the survey. So the first thing to remember is this was done really early on um, when I think a lot of South Africans thought it was going to be the initial kind of month or three weeks of lockdown and then things would kind of pretty much go back to normal. And of course, we know that didn't happen at all. Um, the Cultural Observatory works a lot with the industry. So we had this massive database um, that we could, we could send out the survey to and um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of creatives filled it in. We had uh, six or 700 um, responses from all the different um, areas. And one of the things we noticed very quickly, as um, David was saying as well, is that the impact on the business depended on um, the mode of um, operation. So if you were mostly face to face, then you lost three quarters of your um, of your income very, very quickly. So um, a lot of those businesses said they couldn't continue with any of their activities or only with a small part. Um, and then David also mentioned freelancers, the same thing. So uh, freelancers were much more heavily in, um, affected than those people who were employees or employers. Um, but then an added dimension in the African context is informality. Um, so a lot of the creative industries in South Africa and other African countries actually uh, are not in the formal economy in the sense that they're not registered for tax. They don't, um, uh, they don't have a registered business um, name or a bank account in the name of their business. Um, and this caused some, some issues because how do you provide support? So it's hard enough to provide support to freelancers, but it's almost impossible to provide support to people operating informally. And as you can see um, from this picture, they were also really uh, hard hit um, by, uh, by the shutdown um, because they didn't have contracts that could be, uh, could be enforced. Um, the government initially offered uh, some support to creatives saying that if they could show that they had been uh, that, that they'd had contracts which had been cancelled or indefinitely postponed, which applied to like 95% of people in the sector, 
um, then they would receive some um, sort of income support. Um, but a lot of people who filled in the survey said, well, that's all very well, but normally I arrange things via WhatsApp, you know, so I get a, a WhatsApp message saying, can you make this gig or can you do the uh, makeup for, for this particular um, artist uh, or, or whatever? And then I say yes, and we negotiate a price and that's how it is, right? There isn't a formal kind of contracting uh, process. And so they couldn't show evidence um, of... Uh, of of being affected and so that meant that they weren't offered um, support. So one of the things that we did was that we we calculated a sort of vulnerability score across the the sector um, basically just through asking um, the, the extent of business continuity during the lockdown and also looking at the factors that affected the sector the most. Um, the one that came out as most uh, vulnerable is, of course, performance and celebration, and that's because they're mostly face-to-face, -face, so 95% of them produce face-to-face, -face, and they also had a relatively high level of informality, so that would be like uh, 37% nearly, and mostly freelancers. And then the second most vulnerable, which was a bit of a surprise for us, was audio, visual, and interactive media, so that's kind of film, TV, uh, podcasts and so on um, and I guess it was surprising because we sort of think of that as something you can carry on consuming and engaging with during the shutdown but of course their production mode requires different groups of people to physically get together into spaces and South Africa also does an awful lot of international film servicing so um, we've got quite a, an attractive uh, film incentive uh, and so foreign films come and, and shoot, especially around Cape Town, um, and uh, that brings in a great deal of foreign direct investment for South Africa. And of course, all of that shut down. As David said, none of us are traveling anywhere. Uh, some sectors like design and creative services and cultural natural heritage were less um, vulnerable, and that was really because um, a lot of people working in those sectors were formally employed and they were... Um, uh, they, they were earning a kind of a salary, and so then they did qualify for um, some level of support. Um, we asked about adaptation strategies. Now, this is just to emphasize this was really early on, right? And um, uh, a lot of businesses indicated they were doing productive stuff, like they moved online, or they worked from home, or they pivoted to other kinds of work, or they used the time to upskill. But even really early on, there, was, there were groups who said, well, we're using up our reserves to survive, or we're relying on family for support. Okay. Um, so they were able to do things like in the first couple of months of, of lockdown, whether that's still the case, we don't know. We're about to launch the second um, survey to follow up on that. Um, very few employers so who, who had formal employees said that they were ending permanent contracts at this stage, but already in the first couple of months, about a third of them ended the informal or short-term contracts or asked people to take, um, take a wage cut. So we can imagine things have got worse um, since then. Um, there were some interesting adaptations. Um, the one was a drive-in festival that happened in December. Um, it's called Seit Oster Fierce, and they did some really innovative stuff with large um, screens and outdoor stages and people watching from inside their cars, um, which, which I think went down quite well, although they admit they didn't make any money, right? It was more about continuity, um, giving people a way of still accessing the arts and providing some jobs for um, uh, for creatives and technical crew but they got for example the film studio they got it kind of half price because nobody no one else was using it so they said it's not a sustainable business model going forward and um, we did do some research with the, the people who went so like an audience survey and they said that they they loved it it was one of the most positive surveys we've ever had probably because there wasn't all that much else to do but also because the drive-in format really helped a bit in terms of still making people feel that they were part of a kind of connected society. And one of the big problems with moving online in South Africa is the so-called digital divide, right? That if you have access to reasonable um, internet, Wi-Fi that's not too expensive, 
um, and a, a device that you can use to access the internet, then you're kind of on one side of the divide. But we've got a big population that's on the other side of the divide, right? Who, who don't have um, uh, Wi-Fi access or who only have a, a little phone, so the sound and vi visuals is not very um, uh, is not not very good. Um, and also our um, cell phone data costs in South Africa are very expensive, right? So one of the most expensive in the world, I think. Um, it's the one thing that that I enjoyed and that I pay less for when I travel to other parts of the of the world. Um, we did a, do a later survey specifically related to the music industry and the danger sign there. So this was happening in about August, September was that 35% uh, of uh, musicians and technical crews said they were selling their equipment in order to survive. So hopefully you sold your second best trumpet or your spare speaker or whatever it is, um, but that still shows a pretty worrying level of disinvestment from the, uh, from the industry. And the thing about um, performing in South Africa in the smaller venues is that you have to have your own equipment, right? So the venue itself doesn't have the equipment. So if they book your band or your uh, orchestra or whatever it is, you have to come with your own sound equipment. Otherwise, you can't play in those venues, right? So, so I think we're seeing longer term, you know, quite a significant um, impact. Um, some of the bigger festivals did go completely online. So the National Arts Festival that happens in sort of June, July, um, did move completely virtual. Um, I, I'm not too sure how successful that was. They had to do it very quickly. Um, and they're, they're thinking of doing some kind of a hybrid model um, for this, this year. Um, we did do an impact scenario uh, from, from the modeling that we'd done, and um, you can see that we were kind of expecting things would be, well, not back to normal, but closer to normal by the end of 2020. Um, so you can see the big dip there in March when we, we had a sort of complete shutdown, and then we were imagining at this stage, just shows you how dangerous, you know, these kind of predictions are, um, that, that things would improve towards the end of the year, we'd be pretty much back to where we were. Of course, that's not the case. We had another very hard lockdown in December, January, all the beaches were closed, no alcohol was being sold, um, and no um, venues were, were open at all. So uh, it's probably a lot worse than this. We need to stand on our curves, I think, and extend this maybe a couple of years. Um, in terms of the rest of Africa, there have been some studies that have been done. So the little map with all the, um, the, the dots shows you where uh, research into the impact of the of the of COVID on the um, on the creative sector has has happened. Um, the data is a little bit difficult to compare, but there is research that that does that does do that. Um, so you can get a sense of the turnover that was lost in the second quarter of 2020, um, and it's kind of linked to. Um, the level of informality. So you can see in Kenya, for example, a very high level of informality, like 80% uh, of the creative industries is, um, uh, is missing uh, from the formal sector. Um, and that might be just because of the way the industry works. So I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but it just is very difficult then to provide government assistance um, to that sector. Okay, so I think that's uh, where I'm going to um, going to stop, and um, I'll hand back to the chair. Thank you, Jan. Um, so we'll move uh, to. I, I don't see any pressing questions from the chat, and so. Uh, to reset, to reset, may I interrupt yes. you? There is one remark from Linia Marquez. She's saying a similar situation is happening in other countries. In Portugal, many culture and creative entrepreneurs and artists don't get to the financial support because they don't respond to the necessary criteria from the government. Could you comment possibly, Jen, related to what you presented to the other situations in other countries? Thanks. Um. Thanks. Yeah, well, well, just to say, you know, we share your pain. Um, we got some comments from uh, from the creatives asking about government support. Um, if this is in the South African context. And I mean, some of them are really quite revealing. So um, the fact that you were informal or freelance doesn't mean that you were like a low income, 
a person, you know, you might be very high income, high education, um, but it was just that you hadn't seen the need or the benefit to, to becoming formal. And, and then there's not that much government support generally um, for creative sector or formal sector um, in African countries. And so there isn't a big push, you know, to, to become formal. So uh, one comment we got was somebody saying, um, as an actor, I've been working informally as an independent contractor. No one ever advised me to register myself as a business. And therefore I have no way to claim for potential losses, you know. Um, so, so I think that um, maybe one of the things that the pandemic has done in, in South Africa is to really kind of um, highlight how important it is to have some kind of a formal um, business sector to get small businesses, especially even if they're just one person freelance businesses to be registered. Um, and maybe um, that's something that's that good that will come out of the, um, the whole thing. now yeah thank you for that um so let's um ask now um enrico uh, yeah. to present would you like to share your screen um, yes you ready for i'm ready great let me there share we can see your slides okay and Wonderful. we can see it yeah okay thank you very much and uh well, uh, thank you also, Jen, for, for having to introduce a, a perspective of the impacts of more of performing arts and you know, the regions. My, my intervention, my, uh, uh, my contribution will be more about uh, well, Europe, being uh, in Italy, and especially on the impacts and uh, reactions that uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, has triggered in the heritage and museum sector. And basically this is uh, this analysis and, uh, and some proposals uh, are the result of uh, reflections that I'm developing also with other colleagues, uh, Giovanna Segre and Andrea Morelli. So it is also, I think this uh, uh, webinar, it's a very useful opportunity to exchange views uh, with colleagues and other scholars about uh, uh, these APS. Well, let me let me just start with uh, in Europe. We had uh, uh, today. We are in the second wave of the pandemic and uh, with the second wave of lockdowns. And in the heritage and museum sectors, so there have been, uh, as David was saying, already. Uh, an extensive analysis and surveys of uh, data about the uh, losses and the negative effects that the lockdown as uh, the two lockdowns has brought into the heritage and, uh, and the museum sector. Basically, from an economic viewpoint, we can consider that both the supply and demand shocks so on supply because actually the lockdowns uh, made the heritage institutions and the museums to, to, to to, over, to close down completely their activities, but also the demand shocks, as a, we pretty know all around the world, there has been a, a kind of stop in international mobility where uh, in a context where tourism was feeding uh, the demand of the heritage and museum sectors. And in this slide, I am just proposing some uh, uh, some some graphics from uh, the two surveys that uh, have been uh, undertaken by the network of uh, the European Museum Organizations that clearly show the um, magnitude of the impacts uh, uh, of the COVID-19 on the museums and the heritage sectors. 90% of museums around the world have been temporarily closed for weeks or months uh, and they have suffered, uh, uh, most of them have suffered income losses uh, up to 30,000 euros per week, for example. One thing that uh, I think it's useful to also to underline that uh, was also quite illustrative of the situation, especially in Europe uh, and in Italy, is that, for example, the first lockdown for heritage institutions and museums that were supported or funded by government, uh, it, it has been also considered quite uh, uh, 
quite a relief uh, to be closed because they could spend that time for making some investments or some activities that when they were open they couldn't do and uh, somehow the situation for uh, for uh, government funded or government owned uh, institutions uh, has been relatively better than for example museums relying mostly on private funding because in that case they suffer the greater vulnerability. Uh, you can see from the from the data here that, uh, of course, from the from uh, the, the main source of losses come from the drop in travel uh, and tourism. But it is interesting also to report uh, how 64% of uh, museums reported that the interruption of the school year uh, was a very important, uh, had a very important impact on their activities, uh, stressing also the educational activities that many museums carry on. And uh, uh, also the, the, the graphics um, at the bottom of the slide present that the major impact in terms of economic losses came from tickets. So, uh, as in many other countries, I would say, uh, the analysis of the reaction of the response of museums and heritage institutions have been mainly to rely on uh, uh, the digital infrastructure, investing in the digital infrastructure, moving on the digital and the virtual uh, platforms in order to maintain the relationship with their audiences. Uh, I think uh, in many countries, not only in Italy, but in Europe, uh, this strategy has been the, the ones that have been, has been mainly pursued by all the cultural heritage institutions. And uh, basically, there has been a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, social media uh, activity, followed by uh, improvement in the digital uh, and online collections, and again also video content uh, like in other platforms uh, as YouTube and uh, uh, and Vimeo. But the point that this. Uh, this strategy actually from the supply side has been uh, apparently also accepted from the demand side as uh, for example this uh, uh, graphic show here with popularity of museum online services it seems there has been uh, a kind of acceptance of all these activities uh, through social media and educational materials provided by museums uh, but of course uh, and this is the uh, other side of the coin uh, uh, terming uh, one of the key problems basically is that many museums and heritage institutions, especially those of the small or medium size, were not prepared to this digital, sudden digital transformation of their activity. And in this context, for example, there are also a lot of reports or uh, data, even in the surveys uh, uh, of the network of the European Museum Organization that report how difficult it has been for many or some of these uh, institutions to uh, effectively transform and produce quality content. Uh, and in fact, uh, this uh, graphic here shows that after the two lockdowns that have experienced the museums now recognize that building a digital strategy for the museum or uh, building, investing in a new digital infrastructure has become uh, possibly uh, the priority. Another point that, however, is very important uh, that is not directly connected to uh, the digital response, but uh, is uh, another uh, very crucial issue is uh, whether in this basically in this uh, uh, huge impasse or a huge part, um, period in which museums have seen uh, they have been closed or have seen a, a huge reduction in their visitors uh, when they could be open uh, how they seek new funds what are the strategies or the new organizational model in order to be sustainable even in the future and uh, this uh, slide, this uh, sorry, this uh, uh, this graph here, uh, basically, well, first of all, from again from the survey shows that only a very out of six hundred 
responses or respondents, not many museums have idea of how to uh, be more sustainable in the future because we had a maximum of 100, 150 uh, responses of institutions that have that answered with some idea on how to seek additional funding. Secondly, there is a, a quite expectation that uh, uh, they can uh, obtain additional funding for some of them through online program, for example, for a fee, or for example, with uh, web shops uh, or some other online activities. But in other cases, uh, there is a more general developing new projects or private funding. So the point is, uh, this um, how to seek additional funding is possibly coupled with the digital response of museum, uh, one the two main uh, issues that the cultural heritage sector has to face uh, in the COVID pandemic, but also thinking about the post-COVID era. And indeed, uh, what starting from this uh, from this uh, uh, situation. Uh, we started thinking, well, uh, what could happen in the future, even after that the, the crisis would be uh, somehow solved? Uh, are these changes uh, or these impacts uh, brought by the COVID uh, leading to some structural change in the heritage and museum sector? And here, if, if we think, uh, there are two main uh, issues. First, uh, as uh, we read, we have read or we have recognized in many debates, uh, there is the first position that say that, uh, uh, well, the COVID-19 has basically accelerated long lasting trend toward innovation, especially to digital technologies uh, in the museum sector that in the past possibly suffered from barriers, organizational, cultural barriers in their adoption. Uh, today, there is no longer any excuse to uh, to not try experiment in the digital transformation because uh, uh, this uh, is uh, something very necessary, possibly also for the uh, mission or survival of the museum. But, uh, and this is the point, uh, we can say that the COVID is possibly also questioning the development model of museums and heritage institutions, especially with reference to the audience target and the revenue sources. In, as in Europe and in some cities of Europe, in some areas of Europe, uh, Italy is a, is a case, uh, uh, again, many museums uh, were also relying uh, too much on uh, tourism and long haul tourism as one of the uh, stable sources for uh, development and growth. And today, of course, uh, there is the risk that uh, uh, this uh, source of income or economic resources uh, coming from long haul de tourism demand is not easily uh, recoverable in, uh, in the near future. And indeed, what we are uh, basically thinking are, is that there are two main trajectories and uh, of structural change uh, and the change in orientation of, uh, of museums. This is at least something that we consider as an opportunity for the heritage uh, and museum sector. The first uh, trajectory is uh, what we consider a, a, a convergence between uh, the digital and physical experience. Uh, so far, we have seen that uh, a lot of institutions have invested in the digital uh, infrastructure, in, in investing in digital content, but we believe, uh, and there are already some signals in this direction, that uh, possibly the, uh, the main challenge will be how to deal with the convergence between uh, the digital and physical experiences. Some scholars have also started to call it uh, physical, digital or digitality, uh, also in, in connection to uh, virtual reality and other types of experience. But in general, the issue of the convergence between the digital and the physical experience would be of paramount importance. Um, how it can be applied in the heritage sector, especially for, for what uh, uh, we are thinking on, on the on the ideas that we have. Well, basically, if you think uh, in, uh, in due to the lockdown or the 
uh, health uh, restrictions that uh, many institutions had to comply with. For example, nowadays many museums have accepted uh, compulsory online reservation for on-site visits. Otherwise, visitors cannot enter, cannot visit the museum. And this uh, um, very small change apparently could give, uh, could lead to a radical change in the way museum uh, can uh, have uh, a relationship with their audience. For example, creating an advanced tracking for future visitors. Uh, if I'm an institution that know in advance uh, a visitor that uh, has reserved online, possibly I can know better uh, about uh, his uh, or her tastes, preferences, and and start somehow a kind of uh, uh, dialogue with uh, uh, the future visitor. And then I have also data and information about these visitors for uh, after the visit. And this means that the experience of the museum and the heritage of the museum collection and the heritage can not only be limited to the physical to the on-site visit, but can be extended on a longer period, both before and uh, after. The second main trajectory of structural change is what I was saying before. Uh, it is very likely, at least this is a, uh, this is a chance, that in the, in the future, at least in the next five years, museums uh, need to rely more on local audience and proximity tourism as a source of stability for museum activities. We are not saying that uh, th that stability will be a financial stability, but also in terms of how to plan uh, their activities, they will have to think more about how to attract, how to uh, interact with local audiences and uh, uh, tourists and visitors coming from approximate regions. Uh, and this is also one thing that from a research viewpoint has been somehow under, under studied, uh, especially the pattern motivation and uh, behavior of uh, proximity tourists. Uh, it, this is something that uh, in, uh, in, the, in the literature is almost lacking and uh, as a research agenda, I would say, and possibly this will be one very interesting uh, point to uh, develop. But these two trajectories, the, the uh, convergence between digital and physical experience and the local audience and proximity tourism, lead to what we thought can be a, um, a, a change in orientation that actually was already there because uh, from transactional to relationship orientation is not our uh, well, is not our notion, but uh, we uh, ported this definition from uh, a paper by Camarero and Garrido, in which a relationship orientation means to uh, not to think just on the single uh, to well for a museum for a heritage institution to think how to maximize visitors or think about the visitor just as a uh, one day visit and nothing more, but to create, develop and maintain a committed interactive exchange with customers over time. Uh, it could be a novel way to see membership schemes so that there, there is another, again, uh, uh, ingredient of the museum and heritage sector, but due to the convergence between the digital and the physical experience, uh, these uh, old models uh, that uh, used to be uh, used to target uh, a, a minor, a minority group of people that were deeply interested in supporting or living the heritage. Today, with the convergence between the digital and the physical experience, can be uh, innovative, can and can be extended. How, especially relying on uh, audience data and new metrics to access heritage institutions accountability, especially online. So mixing the, the digital and the physical activities of the museums. Uh, just to give you some insights or uh, how these, uh, these uh, debate has been, uh, these ideas have been translated. I'm reporting here some insights from Italy. Uh, two main experiences that we had uh, in the policy debate in the last month. The first is uh, 
that after the first lockdown, uh, it has been proposed and uh, apparently it will be implemented. Uh, one thing that uh, has been called, uh, well, uh, the Netflix of Italian culture, basically due to the lockdown uh, and the closure of uh, many institutions and the emphasis on the need to, to, to put online the activities of the museum, the heritage sectors, but also the performing arts institutions, think about uh, opera houses and so on. At the ministry level, there has been uh, the idea to support the development of what has been uh, also uh, in a pro provocative way called the Netflix of Italian culture. Uh, you see the logo here, that means there has been already created a, a, a platform for this. But this, this proposal has been also uh, quite criticized for many reasons uh, that uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not developing too much here, but basically the idea was, first of all, uh, how, well, is it effective to create a brand new platform uh, just trying to selling out the digital um, cultural content from Italian heritage and performing arts institutions? Uh, is it the real model to monetize such digital content? In France, for example, in the same uh, way, uh, there has been uh, well, some of some of the some of the uh, observers of these initiatives said, well, we have already uh, the national broadcasting television with online channels. Why to not simply use one of these uh, publicly funded uh, channels uh, to be the real platform of uh, of uh, Italian uh, cultural uh, content? So this is a, a first point that has emerged. The need to create a kind of a platform in order to gather and create a critical mass of content produced by heritage and cultural institutions in Italy, but of course with the risk to be uh, to have many problems in uh, also in being in targeting the audiences in being interesting for the audiences. Another instead, I, I would say, very interesting experience that uh, has emerged has been debated is instead uh, some proposals for developing new subscription models for museums. Uh, that is to replace the purchase of a single visit with the purchase of a subscription for the contents and services that museums offer, both virtual and on-site. And this proposal was made by the director of the Pinacoteca di Brera, uh, one of the state museums uh, that have become uh, autonomous, that is uh, the benefit of financial autonomy. And uh, in December, the director of the Pinacoteca di Brera uh, published a manifesto basically proposing this uh, idea that the museum and the experience of the museum should be both virtual and on site. And the, the interesting thing is that they have already developed uh, uh, a project that is called Brera Plus. You can visit it. And, uh, and the, the very simple idea is that whenever you, uh, you can, first of all, uh, subscribe uh, through the online in order to get the content. And this is Brera Plus becomes a kind of platform where you can uh, uh, purchase uh, on-site visit, but also access the uh, online content that is provided by the museums, not only digital collections, but documentaries uh, and other videos. Uh, this seems, uh, well, it's a quite novel uh, initiative, but seems quite uh, interesting. The only risk that uh, we think is in this case is, well, what happens if uh, all the institutions or many institutions develop their own subscription models and their own platforms? We already see in uh, the uh, online streaming service world uh, that there is a very high fragmentation of online subscriptions uh, with many players and of course in the heritage sector this risk to be even more uh, fragmented. So just to conclude uh, this uh, reflection uh, from, uh, from our analysis of, this of the opportunities of the structural change in the heritage sector, what we are working is also a kind of a provocation to uh, and applied to Italy 
the idea to develop or to test the viability of a universal subscription scheme for Italian state museums that are about 400 uh, institutions from Uffizi Gallery to uh, Pinacoteca di Brera to, for example, uh, uh, Pompeii, uh, archaeological areas like the Colosseums in Rome. Uh, and this idea, let me say, is, uh, well, um, as a, um, takes inspiration from uh, uh, a kind of model, a model of, uh, that uh, exists in some countries or regions, that is the museum pass uh, for residents that there is in the Netherlands, as far as we know, but especially in Piemont and Lombardia, uh, where I come from. And the intuition is try to imagine one year access to online content and on site visits for both Italian and foreign audience uh, to the Italian state museums. Uh, this proposal uh, is uh, basically, we think it's uh, a proposal, a model for fully realized, first of all, the museum's relationship orientation in the post COVID era. So I try to say, well, compared to the past, museum passes for residents can possibly enhance what we see this relationship orientation more uh, due to the integration also with uh, between the online and the and the physical experience of museums uh, there can be also an argument that uh, a museum pass uh, because because it is also a membership scheme can trigger individual support to cultural heritage here the idea is that uh, uh, some people, some maybe have visited just once Italian state museums, but uh, facing a, a, well, a membership scheme at a higher price, maybe they can be interested also in or willing to pay for this scheme at least for one year or two in order to support in general the cultural heritage. And finally, the scheme has the opportunity of exploit network and platform economies, bottom line, for example, providing a critical mass of digital cultural content, but also triggering the, the real network of Italian state museums. That is something that in Italy, there is a policy going on trying to develop this kind of network. And for example, there are already some interesting experiences of circulation of uh, very important and iconic artworks from uh, Uffizi or other, other museums to minor museums in other areas of the country. And this, again, it's, it's a way of uh, circulating the content, not online, but physically, that can be also a quite powerful image for, uh, for this initiative. What are the challenges? And this is uh, possibly the main uh, interesting part. First of all, we are trying to understand if it is really economic viable, this, uh, this uh, issue. Uh, basically, we are computing, uh, we are trying to, to compute which would be well, a kind of uh, break even price based on the past demand of uh, uh, Italian state museums, both of uh, Italian audience and foreigners. I cannot uh, say that we have already uh, a, a, a figure on, on that price, but we are trying to work on it. And of course, there are many assumptions or that uh, should be made in order to consider the viability of this, uh, of this scheme. For example, the pricing issue in terms of uh, the elasticity of demand, what happened uh, of all the people that has visited just once Italian State Museum, are they really willing to pay for a scheme that should be at least higher, at least double or three times the value of a single ticket? But at the same time, this could possibly trigger some additional visits. The second point that was already quite known in the cultural economic literature is, uh, well, if we can even solve these uh, demand side issues in terms of, of uh, revenues, how we allocate the revenues, and this was Ginsburg Museum Pass Game, basically, uh, that could lead even to, to a failure in these, uh, in these initiatives. And finally, because this is a quite important point, uh, this scheme is only valid or as a, as a logic if it is able to 
to be something that leads to a major convergence between an integration between online content and uh, physical visits. So the key question is, uh, are the funds uh, uh, obtained through this scheme able to uh, or enough for investing in developing these new services that work on the integration of digital and on-site heritage? So these are more open questions, but uh, this is what we basically our reflection on the uh, heritage sector uh, after the lockdowns and uh, and especially uh, Taylor on the Italian debate. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Enrico. Two very short questions before we proceed with the discussion. Uh, from the chat, Ario Klammer was asking a few questions I will try to ask. As economists, we are inclined to focus on transactions, on incomes, employment, and visitors. That makes sense, but less so when people, politicians included, want to understand the impact of the pandemic. They need to understand the impact of artistic practices or opera lovers made okay, like David pointed out. So do you realize the need for a broader perspective, especially when addressing funders of the arts? And also he additionally pointed out that you addressed the point with the remark on relational practices to see visitors as participants and contributors very shortly, if you may, too, because we're... Uh, yes, I, I I don't have a real answer. I uh, But I get the point, are you possibly say if this proposal somehow makes more uh, audiences be engaged with the, with the, with the institutions? I, I, well, I don't, I don't, I don't have, uh, I don't think that uh, our proposal, at least as far as we, we focus on, on, on a museum pass that uh, provide a better experience uh, on the digital and, uh, and uh, the opportunity to visit. So we are not addressing, unfortunately, this issue, but I recognize that uh, when we say uh, addressing more the local audiences and for uh, the stability of museum, Museums should also uh, cover this uh, this point of uh, getting creating a, a deeper relationship and more interactive with uh, the local audiences. But possibly the scheme that we were thinking about is not uh, addressing this point. Thanks. Just additional short on Valeria Morera was asking was this an Italian or across a European survey? She was referring also to Arias later content. In the chat, uh, she says that I have a sense that cultural practices have indeed changed based on a survey I'm working on with other Italian researchers. Yes, I, I cannot get. Uh, uh, so, is this an it Italian or across Europe? No, Nemo. Nemo. It's uh, across Europe, basically. Okay. It's uh, European museums. It's not representative, but uh, fully representative. But it's a possibly the best we have. Uh, uh. Great. Okay, thanks. I propose we continue because, yes, please, David, I think with the discussion. Please, thanks. David, will you be able to say a couple of words uh, in response to the three presenters? I think uh, will you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, well, look, I, I won't uh, hold things up because I think a lot of people have uh, contributions to make and we should get to the general discussion. Uh, I would just say very, very quickly then, uh, because you've asked me to respond, uh, as it were, to both of the sort of serious presentations. I mean, I really th think the stuff that Jenna's doing in South Africa is really very interesting because it looks like you're going to get a sort of longitudinal view of the of the sort of process of adaptation which goes on uh, to the uh, pandemic as it as it continues. And I think you know, and you have the resources there to be able to do the sorts of surveys that you do through the observatory, and you get uh, you get some pretty good data. And I think that's you know the the interesting thing is going to come when all the data is in and you can 
have some some really interesting things to play with it because you've got such a lot of stuff there and just see what uh, some of the relationships that are going on in 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 that uh, whole process i mean I, there are a lot of interesting points in what you said jen um i mean i think for example the question of access to the internet and the uh, and the fact that uh, you know that, that we take it for granted that uh, you can you know that, that we have access to the internet and uh, uh, and online sort of and Wi-Fi and online services and so much of Africa doesn't have that and that, that, that and so that means the whole process of adaptation is completely different um, and I think that's something which uh, sort of sometimes doesn't occur to us uh, in the countries where we have a, a slightly better uh, uh, service in these respects. Um, just, uh, uh, but I think I really enjoyed what you were saying, and it's uh, and I look forward to seeing some more uh, uh, numbers coming out of your um, out of your shop. Um, but I, and just very quickly in relation to what Enrico was saying in relation to heritage and uh, museums, I mean I think that that there is a, there's some very interesting questions here. And in particular, um, the fact that, as you said yourself, Enrico, a lot of what's going on has been going on for some time. The museums and, and the heritage sector has been moving towards uh, a different mode of operation for quite some time. And so uh, with, with the introduction of uh, new technologies, uh, even VR has, been, uh, has, has happened before the pandemic started. Uh, and, and, and certainly the, um, uh, the, the sort of visit, visitor experience through increased uh, interventions and uh, mobile technologies and so on and so on and so on. I think you know what you're sort of saying, and I think it's true, is that the pandemic and the and the drop off of the audiences and the sudden sort of pressures on the on the on the merit museum sector um, has accelerated these te these tendencies. And I think that that's the, what we're looking at now. And and at the end of the day, well, not the end of the day, because this is a continuing process and will go on um, forever, I suppose, as the technologies uh, continue to grow. But I th but but it is interesting that there, as you were saying, that there are some barriers, internal barriers, to the adoption of some of these technologies before and these really have to fall, fall away entirely but whether or not with it you know it leads to new entirely new business models for museums and and, and so on it's it, that's a little bit more difficult to say um, I mean I think that the the idea of moving to a sort of relationship model rather than a transactional model I think that's quite an interesting one to to think further about um, but uh, but I, I mean, I don't know that the question of convergence between the digital and the and the real experience is uh, quite as uh, strong as you suggest, um, or as you sort of um, propose might well be going on. I, I mean, I think again, the jury's still out on this because I don't know to what extent yet we really do have information on people's preferences to be able to say that. But my own sense is that there is something that is really quite sort of fundamental about the the live experience, whether it's in a whether it's in music, being in the same presence of the musicians, whether it's in the in um, uh, the theatre, whether it's uh, uh, in the gallery, looking at the actual artworks rather than looking at them on the screen, and that's something I think which. Uh, uh, is fairly fundamental in the way in which people approach art, and I think it's uh, it's always been the case. And I and I and it will be interesting to see whether that has actually changed uh, with the advent of better and better digital um, uh, representations. I mean, we said this in relation to music that as the you know as the reproduction of music got better and better and better, you know, people could have a, a, the total symphony orchestra in their in their lounge room, didn't have to go to the concert hall to hear the, to hear uh, the symphonies, and yet people do still go to the concert hall. Why? Because it's a it's a completely different experience to be sitting in the concert hall and listening to the music. That's all I'd say, except to say in relation to what Ario raised. I mean, I I agree entirely that it is about it. The, the, the really interesting questions are the impact on artists and I think that doesn't so much relate to the heritage or the museum sector um, because the heritage the heritage is the same the, you know the paintings are still the same the heritage is still the same that'll go on forever but the but in relation to uh, the rest of the arts the performing arts the visual arts uh, uh, and literature and so on all of the other arts I think um, it's really the role of the artists at the center of the of the of the whole system. This is something that Ariar and I have talked about a lot. Um, you know, the, the sort of and it's the, it's the notion of the concentric circles thing that the you know that in the the structure of the cultural industries, the, the artist is in the center, the creative people are in the center, and that's something which in 
recovering from the pandemic, I think that is a critical issue. And to the extent that we've lost a lot of creative people through who have just dropped out because they couldn't continue, uh, hopefully, you know, many of those will come back. We don't know, and that's, that's, but that's going to be essential. Thanks, that's all I'd say. I'm sorry to take so long because I think there are lots and lots of interesting questions that people would like to, uh, to talk about. Trisa. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking at Andre. I don't know who's uh, leading these. So let's see. Um, I see um, another question. Um, well, actually, I will take my role as a chair to raise a question and maybe invite Francois to give um, um, her ideas on this. So um, Enrico is proposing this one shop um, where you find all of the content of the country, at least these national museums. In France, you have something similar with Le Boutique de Musée. Um, and so, um, uh, Francois, would you be able to say some words perhaps about this uh, French uh, notion and how perhaps if the La Boutique de Musée will start to consider some digital services, for instance, a chat with a curator or some other forms of, um, you know, sellable services? Uh. You ask me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, in France, uh, museums uh, for a while were uh, totally silent. They, they didn't say anything and we were very surprised. And I, uh, I, I met uh, the Ministry of Culture last uh, uh, week and we discussed that. And she said that she was trying to reopen the, the museum. Uh, with uh, the example of Spain and Italy, uh, where the policy is uh, pretty different. And um, what did the museum for uh, uh, during the pandemic? They tried to provide many, uh, um, many uh, experiences, I don't know how to say, uh, on internet and it was free of charge. And we had a strong discussion, especially with the big museum saying it's not a sustainable model. So you have to try to monetize a part of uh, this uh, uh, digitized supply. And now there is a possibilities, a possibility to, uh, to, to have subscriptions for events in museums and but uh, the shops did not really work and did not bring much revenues for museums uh, they are uh, managed by uh, an institution called um, Réunion des Musées Nationaux and uh, of course uh, all the shops were uh, closed and uh, there was a possibility of click on and collect, etc., but it did not work so so well. It was not a, a source of revenues. <laughs> and uh, last point, the museum tried to uh, to keep in touch with uh, the friends, the friends of museums like the American Friends of the Louvre, of uh, of uh, um, networks uh, of friends. But at this time, uh, the, they rely on uh, the support uh, provided by the state or by local authorities. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Um, another question to Jen, perhaps. So um, you mentioned this um, scandalous uh, response that, you know, maybe some artists have to um, sell their own equipment and their own past investment in order to survive. And um, you see this hardly ever in other big sectors that are being uh, supported now by the government. Um, but I think the key question there is to ask, um, do you have an indication on what's going to happen now as these um, government programs end? And um, this um, um, pandemic has highlighted a number of things that as uh, many of you have mentioned are not new. Um, and the responses are now the Corona um, government fund or the Corona related uh, solutions. But um, as we know, these are endemic uh, issues. Do you have an indication on um, maybe future um, government supports or not, uh, initiatives to solve this? 
Um, thanks for the question. Yeah, I mean, the short answer is we, we st we're still in the pandemic and, and there hasn't been an awful lot of government support even now. Um, so I imagine it's going to get worse. And talking to creatives, they've said, well, people are disappearing. In other words, creatives are just dropping out of the industry and going to sell houses, as somebody said. Um, in terms of, of new business models, um, well, there've been some kind of standout successes. I mean, one of the South African ones was the Jerusalem uh, song dance that you might um, know about. And um, this was uh, very, very successful in, on YouTube. Uh, they posted it on YouTube during lockdown. So it currently has something like 340 million um, views. Um, and the creators did earn some money from that, but not as much as you might think, right? So they've given their... Uh, IP, the intellectual property, um, to YouTube. And of course, for performing arts, that's one of the big problems is as soon as you go online, how do you manage your intellectual property in order to actually make some money um, from, the, uh, uh, from the work that you've created? I mean, there've been other stories where um, a well-known stand-up comedian uh, charged uh, a relatively low ticket price for people to log on and watch a live show um, and he found out afterwards that uh, some uh, some pubs and, and other venues had bought one ticket and then they had like put it on a big screen so that all of their customers could um, could watch as well. And and you know, there's how do you manage that kind of thing? So you could say, well, that was you know that was a very um, underhand thing of the venue to do. But from their point of view, we paid for the, you know, we paid for the ticket. And so um, we provided the content to our customers and, and our intellectual property regulations are not keeping up with that kind of thing fast enough. So um, Enrico is mentoring the um, uh, Netflix, you know, so, so it's, it's the, the term being used in South Africa is the fangs, um, <laughs> which is um, related to, um, Netflix and Google and Amazon and, you know, all these big platforms. And they provide a massive potential, right? Um, so, so Facebook is the F, sorry, I'd forgotten that temporarily. Um, but, but they also uh, require sometimes for you to sign over your intellectual property um, to them. So in terms of monetizing, it creates a bit of a a bit of a problem and I imagine the same thing for fine art um, and and for the heritage sector in terms of um, you know how you hang on to your intellectual uh, property which is going to become a big issue online and it's just not something that a lot of African economies have thought about at all. Um, in terms of going forward I'm really hoping that the government is going to realize that they've got to have a big push to try and provide um, support to the creative sector that's a, that that suits the sector, right? So they've already started to say, we'll accept uh, informal agreements like your WhatsApp contract as evidence, you know, that you are actually working in the sector and that you can apply for some income relief. Um, once that stops, well, uh, we don't really know when that will be or what the result will be yet. We're tracking it as David pointed out, yeah. Uh, excellent, thank you, Jan. Um, looking at the time, I'm also looking at Andre. Um, do you see any other questions, Andre, from the chat? My proposal would be that everybody, we are still quite few, um, unmute and ask the questions. If having one, I would have one additional for all, actually, the speakers. You are saying, of course, there is this dichotomy, I would say, on the positive and negative impact of the pandemic on culture sector, negative naturally in terms of drop down that Jen showed in her graphs and positives in terms of the initiatives, in terms of the digitalization um, positives, I would say. What do you expect will be the future here for art sector? Which of those will prevail? And will, will this also have, I would say, some lasting positive effects on the development of cultural organizations? I would say for Enrico and Jam probably, and David naturally as well. Um, can I can I come in briefly? Yeah. Um, so I was having this conversation with with one of my one of my 
PhD students this morning, actually, and, and we were saying, well, maybe digital and in real life, okay, IRL, um, it are not substitutes. Maybe they complements. Um, and so going forward, um, organizations that have moved some of their stuff online because they had to during the complete shutdown um, will keep some of those elements, right? So the things that really worked, um, the relationship building with audiences, the massive use of, of Google. So some of the festivals we're working with are using things like Google Analytics, right, to, to track uh, exactly what people are doing. So which shows are they going to? What are the combinations? Where are they coming from? How are they consuming things? And, and I think that's going to be useful for them forever. Um, but we're also picking up that firstly, very difficult to make money online, right? Really difficult. <laughs> um, and secondly, that people still do want that in-person kind of experience. So, so I think future, we're going to see hybrid models coming up, maybe in really interesting kind of mixes, different audiences engaging in different ways, or maybe the same people, but engaging in, um, you know, in a mixture of ways. Um, so I think that could be quite a positive um, outcome for, for African countries where we are, we, we can't just move online in one go, right? Um, uh, and we'll have to think of ways of reaching people on the other side of the digital um, divide um, in order to make that a sustainable thing going forward. Yeah, if I could, if, whoops, if I could comment on that, I mean, I, I, I agree um, that, uh, uh, and I think it reflects something that's been said already this evening that, uh, or today, that uh, um, there have been a whole lot of tendencies and trends going on in the cultural sector over many years that, that are in a way simply being accelerated by the pandemic. I mean, if you think about music, for example, and how, how radical the transformation of music consumption has been in the last 20 or 30 years since the, since the uh, first the invention of the CD, the compact disc, and then uh, uh, online streaming and so on, you know, these things have really tr radically transformed the way in which music is both produced and consumed. And at the end of the day, what do we find? No, it isn't the end of the day, it's still going on. But one of the things that we do find, and it's become sort of more obvious, is that the live concerts of the bands uh, or whatever is still something that people want. Um, it's still, uh, going to the movies in the movie theater is still something people want, despite the fact that they can look at it at home, you know, sitting by themselves on their, on their sofa in their lounge room. It's a different experience from going to a movie house and watching a comedy with, you know, with, with many other people. And these are the sorts of things that people want. I mean, art consumption can be also a social experience. And the same thing could be said of going to museums and galleries. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it is a social experience. Uh, and that is part of the uh, part of the experience for consumers, and I think that's something which, uh, sure, it's being you know, the whole thing has been shaken up by the by the pandemic. But I'm an optimist in in, in response to Andre's uh, question. I mean, I, I well, I'm I'm, a, I'm always an optimist about everything, but uh, but particularly about about this, I I really do think that we'll come out of this in due course with. Um, a sort of strengthened cultural sector. It'll take a while yet because it's, it really has taken a big hit. And I think, you know, we'll, we'll get to see more clearly how, how these things work, how consumption works. And this is, a, this is a responsibility for us as researchers to be able to, 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 to look at this and understand it. And that's why I think we need, we need webinars and seminars like this when we can exchange these ideas because, you know, we don't all think the same things and we all have different points of view and that's what makes life interesting. Can I introduce one other issue? Yeah. Now, one issue that preoccupies me is that um, all the presentations, by the way, are, are mainly supply uh, oriented, right? We sort of worried about the makers and that's, uh, that seems perfectly fine. Um, of course, I'm also interested in what happens to people in their homes uh, who otherwise went to performances and and uh, concerts and whatever festivals, uh, what does that mean for them? Um, and here I have sort of, uh, and I was just curious whether you know of any initiatives. In the Netherlands, saving is increasing by an enormous amount. I mean, um, people don't spend their money, uh, including uh, all the people who used to spend money in the arts and not spending it. 
So um, there are some initiatives in, in the Netherlands trying to roam off some of these uh, additional savings, uh, uh, trying to ask people to donate. Uh, there was a whole campaign of uh, pensioners uh, who uh, would spend some of our social, uh, would donate some of their social security uh, for uh, the arts and the government was so enthusiastic about it that they decided to match these amounts. Uh, but do you know of any other such initiatives where people, where we try to sort of get back some of the money that otherwise would have spent and is not spent. I mean, there, there must be, there is, an, there is a real serious market failure here because people would like to spend, but they don't know how. At least that's what I notice. I think that's a research project, Ariel. You better get a PhD student to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank <said>. you, David. <laughs> but do you think it's interesting? Oh yeah, of course, of course it is, absolutely, uh, by all means. And 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 uh, I mean, I I don't have an answer to that, uh, and I don't know of any schemes. But what do you do, David? Do you do you because do you donate now more money than you did before? As a matter of fact, yes, but I, yeah, I, I think that might be my stage of life rather than... Rather than no, yeah, but I discovered there were some, some initiatives of local musicians who started a whole project and it's sort of fun to participate, but also to donate money and to be part of that. So I myself find in my own practices some changes that I am more trying to connect with artists doing their work and yeah, because I don't spend any money on, on performances, concerts and whatever. So I, I have money to spare. I mean, uh, so my practice changed. Hmm. Well, we've got plenty of artists in Australia that would, would, would welcome your uh, input, Ariel, if, uh, if, if you'd like to send, spend some, send some money this direction, we'll, uh, we'll make okay. it. <laughs> David and Ariel, if I may interrupt you and to all, yes, I think we should finish some, I think David has to move forward and so on. We do apologize today. We will not have the post seminars, but apparently for next time we should. The questions that you put others in the chat, we will try to answer them later. I think there's, a, and I, I can speak in the name of both and in the seminar organizers, we thank you a lot. The seminar, I think, showed that we really need such exchanges, that even the time was too short and hoping to see you, I hope, in two weeks' time, we will announce the presentations on time. Thanks again to all, and I hope you enjoyed the conversations and the presentations. Thanks to all the speakers, naturally, as well. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And just a big a last note, um, the URL um, with the YouTube channel will also be distributed uh, soon so you can uh, further ask your students uh, to join the discussion and others. Great. Thank you very much, all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.